Dr. Rediger, let's start where you started with everyone who you talked to and interviewed for your book at the beginning. Mm. We're going to start at your beginning. Your background is an Amish background, which is fascinating. Can you talk a little bit about where you're from and your foundation in terms of faith, family, food, mm. health? Yeah, sure. So born into a family with an Amish background, very rural. We moved out of the Amish area when I was two years old. Um, my parents left that world outwardly, but not so much inwardly, mm -hmm. I think. And so grew up on a farm, uh, which is a great way to grow up in some ways. I think uh, uh, we grew our own wheat and my mom, they stone ground the wheat for bread, for muffins, for pancakes, all of which I ate a lot of. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's good eating though. <laughs> that's good eating. I've had the Amish cooking, it's yep. good cooking. <laughs> Absolutely. Lots of meat and potatoes, mm -hmm. uh, often meat at pretty much every meal. And uh, lots of hard work and work with the soil, which I think was great. Also no TV, no radio. Um, very much a concern that those worldly influences were a problem. And so uh, it was also a restrictive world in some ways. Um, the world I was raised in really believed that you r regain or keep your spirituality by leaving the larger culture. And I think where I've moved over the years is to believe that the spiritual world really exists within culture, no matter what that culture is, and that there's something sacred underneath everything that's going on. It took me a long time to arrive at that. Um, but store-bought clothes were not a big part of our life. My mom mostly made our clothing. Mm -hmm. I was living in one culture at home and a very different culture in public school during the day, mm -hmm. being exposed to all kinds of things like science and um, how about like health and nutrition? I mean, I know you're eating a lot of meat and potatoes and probably right. like the homemade butter, right? Right. Um, although everything was real, right. right? Nothing was processed. Right. But what about like the treatment of your body and how you viewed health and taking care of oneself? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, a lot of what was great about our diet growing up was there wasn't a lot of processed foods. We didn't have the cold cereals or the chips or sodas of modern life, which I think honestly was a very good thing in retrospect, but definitely heavy on the meat and the starches and that sort of thing. Yeah. So at what point then in your life did you become interested in medicine and specifically psychiatry? Uh, yeah. So. I had a job as an orderly when I was in high school, working in the local medical hospital, and really fell in love with that then. Mm -hmm. And so I was taking people to the morgue. I was helping nurses clean patients, roll people over, take people to surgery. That was a great introduction for me into the world of medicine. Mm -hmm. The nurses were very good to me, taught me a lot. I had spent a lot more time with the nurses than the doctors at that level. And, and they said, you know, you should become a doctor. You're, you have a really nice bedside manner. I didn't really consider that as an option at the time, but it stuck in my um, back of my mind for a long time. So I thought it was interesting in your book, Cure, that you said, I mean, in medical school, they kept firing at you, all of you as students, don't ask questions, don't ask questions, don't ask questions, right? Learn the material, know right. the material, don't ask questions. Um, your book is all about asking questions, <laughs> a lot of questions, right? Deep questions. Are you just curious by nature or were you also someone who was like, you know what, if you tell me not to do something, I'm gonna go the total opposite way. <laughs> like, were you a little bit of a rebel? <laughs> I'm a little bit of a rebel. Mm -hmm. Questions drive me, yeah. and that can be challenging mm -hmm. for, for a family that's trying to adhere to a particular religious viewpoint and that sort of thing. So I think I was a tough kid to raise. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we deep dive into spontaneous healing, what that is, and a lot of what you mm. write about in the book, 
I want to get your thoughts on traditional medicine. Uh, um, just so anybody who's listening knows what your viewpoint is on that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I think traditional medicine is brilliant and life-saving in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that we can heal and solve with acute injury and illness. If a person comes in with diabetic ketoacidosis with a blood sugar of 900, mm -hmm. they're not gonna die. You can usually save them. You'll move them quickly to the intensive care unit and you'll do all of the life-saving treatments that are just brilliant. We can put in cardiac stents. We can save people who have had massive strokes, all kinds of things. But we're not so good with the major killers. 75% of the healthcare dollar goes to the chronic diabetes, the heart disease, the cancers, the autoimmune illness, the lung disease. These we now are learning, um, these are lifestyle illnesses and that's a very different way of thinking. So I think of modern medicine as really being like a uh, long line of ambulances at the bottom of a tall cliff and people are falling off the cliff. These ambulances whisk people away to the hospital, mm -hmm. do amazing life-saving things but we should have guardrails at the top of the cliff so people don't need to fall off. And the people I study with spontaneous remission have found a way to climb back up the ladder to the top in a way that's really miraculous and shocking. And I think we should be studying them. Yes, yeah, so your studies took you to Brazil. Yes. What did you find in Brazil? Let's talk a little bit about what that experience was like and what prompted you to go there of all places in the first place. Yeah, good question. So in 2002, an oncology nurse at Mass General in Boston called me and said that she had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, told that she had a few months to live. She then went to Brazil. She began calling me saying that she was seeing some amazing healings and believed that she was receiving a healing herself. She stayed much longer than planned. She came back from Brazil, was just a different lady, uh, just so happy and loving and took her children down to Brazil and really was on a very important journey, who I owe a great debt to because of what she started. So I refused to go down to Brazil. I thought, there's nothing real going down there. I was very skeptical. And so she was stubborn. She began having people call me from around the country and elsewhere saying they had medical evidence for their recoveries. Did I want to hear their stories? I said, no, thank you. <laughs> Real don't ask questions, don't ask questions. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> right. I mean, I was a new faculty uh -huh. member at Harvard and mm -hmm. medical director and yeah. I was skeptical about anything real going on, but I also was concerned about what my colleagues would think. Sure, because here you're at Harvard, right? right. I mean what an institution it right. is. Right, it's a great institution. Right. You had a rep right. to protect. Right, absolutely. <laughs> right? right? And so you've got a woman saying, come to Brazil, there are these miracles happening. And right. you're like, oh, wait a minute. Right, yep, no that way. That was not no, in my you. medical book. <laughs> no. Nope, not interested. <laughs> mm -hmm. But something made you interested. Yeah, so she uh, continued to have people call me and they, I did begin to look at the evidence and you know, you can't dispute evidence um, so it looked like something really was going on and I overcame my misgivings and decided to go down to Brazil. What was the evidence that made you go, okay, there's something more to this than just somebody saying, oh my gosh, I was sick and now I'm not. Yeah. Well, this well, must yeah. be a miracle, right? right. You need, as right. a physician, right? As right. somebody who looked at numbers and stats and research, right. Right. you were looking for more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I had three criteria for the research that I did. I told people I wouldn't even talk to them about their story unless they had medically indisputable evidence for accurate diagnosis and clear evidence for recovery. That was one criteria. The uh, second criteria was it had to be a genuinely incurable illness according to all that we currently understand. So it had to be pancreatic adenocarcinoma or it had to be uh, glioblastoma multiform or illnesses that we really don't in traditional medicine have a path for recovery or healing for. Mm -hmm. So it was a personal journey in a lot of ways too. It had to be something that was convincing to me. And the third criteria for the research uh, for me was there had to be no other possible explanation. Uh, it couldn't be an experimental medication that they tried or anything like that. Okay. And so in looking into Brazil, 
yeah. after Nikki encouraged you to check it out, right. you were seeing multiple cases of stories that fit that criteria. Yeah, now it's a complicated journey. It, mm -hmm. it was a lot of winnowing because there's, you know, these are real life stories with suffering. Mm -hmm. There are absolutely situations where people wanted to believe they were getting better, but the evidence didn't support it. Mm -hmm. uh, people who wished they were getting better or people who probably were getting better, but there was too many contravening variables such as chemotherapy or radiation or surgery or something that could potentially be an explanation. And so I couldn't, that was not going to be a place I could deal with my skepticism. Mm -hmm. So I had to winnow through a lot of cases. And also the teaching uh, in Brazil, they had published in these popular books that 90 to 95 percent of the people who went there were healed. And I can tell you that it wasn't anything near that high. Mm -hmm. And so it, these are human stories and they're complicated. And so it took a long time to begin finding a path through that. It was very interesting to me to be a part of a culture that understands the mind and the body in a very different way. Mm. I think we are socialized in our culture into thinking about the mind and body being very separate and we have unexamined assumptions about what's possible and what's possible for the mind. And the mind is very powerful, but we are a very material culture and so we view the world that way. When you're in a different culture, their assumptions they grew up assuming very different things about the mind and the body. And it's, it's fascinating to sit in a different culture and realize, oh, they use the same words, but they mean something really different. So what about that culture and what about the people of Brazil did you find the most like fascinating and beautiful? And what was it that they were doing that yeah. we were not adopting in our culture. Well, they really believe that illness begins in the soul, for example, mm. and that if you heal the wound in the soul, then the body will follow. And trained as a Western physician, that is a mind-blowing thought. Um, so another way to say that is if you heal the wound in your deeper mind, the body will follow. What does that mean? <laughs> right, except, so you are at Harvard as a trained right. physician, right. but there's this other piece of you that went to Princeton right. and went to, you know, studied theology and got a degree in right. theology at the seminary there. So there's this other piece of you that's open to it. Right. It's great, right? You weren't totally right. closed off. Not totally closed off. I think what's true is these stories have upended a lot of my cherished beliefs that I was trained in, not only in medical school and residency in psychiatry, but also in seminary. And so it's been a, it's been a professional and personal journey around all of this to see my cherished beliefs upended. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so you're in Brazil and we talk about like the beauty of what you saw there in that country and you write a lot about that too and cured um, but then we think, okay, so what about what's going on a little closer to home? So 2012, Cleveland, Ohio, my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. Right. You come here. Um, there's a, a physician, a man named Dr. Isam Naimi, who I have to say, I mean, full disclosure, I know, and he's somebody who I've seen as a patient. He's someone I've interviewed, but someone who I saw as a patient. Uh. And I never had a... Um, a, a a, a life ending illness, right? right? So you hear a lot about going to someone who's a healer, right? And that they're the very sick go to someone who's a healer, right? And so I'm thinking, well, mm. I just feel broken inside, right? I had gone through right. major stresses professionally, right. personally, right. which kind of manifested themselves um, as this lump this mass on my back next uh, to my spine, not knowing what it was. And I, I believe that all came from stress, yeah. which we can get into because you write a lot about stress right. being a silent killer, which we know, we know that logically, but we still keep going at the same pace, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> so I remember going to Dr. Naney saying like, my heart hurts and my soul feels broken. Wow, what an can, articulate statement. Can you do anything for me? Uh, so you understood intuitively the connection. Yes, I yeah. definitely understood the connection. And yeah. so 
the experience I had with him was so hmm. peaceful and serene and I felt lighter, like something had been released, something toxic, yes. um, soulfully toxic and physically toxic had been released from my body. Yes. Um, that was my experience with him. But you, how did you first meet Dr. Naimi? So we met on the Dr. Oz show mm -hmm. and I was the medical expert um, to look at uh, some of the results with patients who had seen him. And it was a, a shocking experience uh, to hear these people who had been raised in the Western world like I had been and still have these experiences and they had medical evidence for their experiences. Um, I wrote in Cured about Dr. Patricia Kane, a physician who had idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis diagnosed by biopsy, and that's a deadly illness. There's no recovery from that. Your lungs turn to cardboard, you can't exchange oxygen, mm. and you die of mm. suffocation, basically. Mm. And she was spending, at one point, 18 to 20 hours a day in bed, sleeping with oxygen, and oxygen um, s support, because she wasn't able to um, oxygenate her body much any longer because the lungs just weren't functional. And she did a number of things, uh, part of which was seeing Dr. Naimi over a period of months. And she tells the story so well, and I tried to be the translator for her telling of the story. And she then was so grateful for the illness because of the way it changed her relationship with herself that she then did house visits for years uh, as a way of expressing gratitude for what the illness gave her, uh, which is just a beautiful story. And she also does this email list called Doc's Daily Chuckle because mm -hmm. she thinks that humor is such an important part of healing and not taking ourselves so seriously. Laughter is medicine, that. isn't Laughter's it? Laughter is medicine. I mean, yeah, that's soulful <laughs> medicine for sure. Yeah, right? right. I mean, you feel differently, even as simple as like you walk around, and you put a smile on your face, and a day you don't feel good, you do like you stand a little taller. That's right. Right. When you walk around and you're like crying or feeling sad or have angst and anger, yeah. like you wear that. Yeah. Right. So, so you meet uh, Dr. Naimi on the Dr. Oz show, and you'd already been to Brazil at this yes. point. So you'd seen uh, a lot of what was going on there. So you're you're open to it, but when you when you come to the Dr. Oz show, is there still a piece of you that's a bit spec uh, skeptical? Yeah, mm -hmm. one of the things that gave me some solace is this is a medical man. He's a physician trained as I had been. He's also an engineer by training, mm -hmm. and. So really grounded in the world of science and understood what that means at a deep level. And that was helpful to me. Uh, and so it's, it's, it was really a nice contrast also with the world of Brazil, which was important. And, but there, it wasn't, I needed another path to try to understand this from a different side. And he was a great has been a great avenue for that. What's interesting about him too, <laughs> that, I mean, here he is doing a national show, but he's not showy at all. Right. You know what I mean when I say that? Right. Like he's not somebody who seeks attention. Right. It's very like quiet, peaceful man who's connected to you, the person in front of him in the moment. Isn't That's right. aware of anything else. So when you are on the show, right. having a conversation with him or in the book, can you talk about you watch something happen right. live on that show, a, yep. a healing of sorts. I mean, right. and I don't, is that what we should call it? Because I know he doesn't necessarily want to call himself a healer, a right. faith healer, but that's mm -hmm. what yeah, you he does not. Yeah, he does not accept that term at all. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the outcome of that story. This is a woman who had back pain, came up from the audience. Mm -hmm. He just prayed for a matter of seconds over her. She said her back pain was gone. I don't have any preceding lab tests indicating what was the pathology of the back. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any uh, results from down the road saying if there's any change or I don't even know if she has pain now, but certainly she reported a healing there. So you, not having all that information about her, you wanted to learn a little bit more about the patients who were 
yes. coming to Cleveland, Ohio. Correct. So you come to Cleveland, Ohio, <laughs> and you start digging, and you start Correct. doing what I'm doing with you, but you're right. like probably asking really, you're going for the tough questions, right? Mm -hmm. Not as a skeptic. And the personal questions. Yeah, that's right. That's and so right. what did you find? How many people did you talk to? Oh boy, over the years, I mean, this has been since 2012 probably. <laughs> So it's been a lot. Uh, Isam and Kathy and Naomi have opened up so many files for me. Mm -hmm. And so I've looked at lots of medical evidence. Cured, to tell the stories that I tell, I try to tell them well enough. Uh, so there's so many stories I didn't have time to go into in Cured. Mm -hmm. uh, but I saw a lot of amazing things. And people's lives who these people were so emotional after experiencing a true transformation of their minds and bodies. And so um, it's, been, it was a, it's been a very helpful laboratory for me to gather medical evidence, look at these stories, interview these people, and try to understand what are the transdiagnostic factors across illnesses that are associated with these kinds of healings. Mm -hmm. The tricky thing about faith is, is, right. is exactly what it is. It's faith. It's that right. thing that you can't always necessarily see with your eyes, right. but that your soul knows to be true, right? right? Um, huh. So, but you, you, you look into the, the power of faith. There was an interesting hmm. study you wrote about where there were like, there was prayer going on. There was, um, there were, like multiple cases, right, right, where people were praying from like across states right. for each other. The prayer you, study. Yeah. That's his prayer study. Right. What is talk talk about that a little yeah. bit? Yeah. So that was the largest study on prayer that's ever been done. Um, Herbert Benson at Harvard is a is a really important figure in the history of mind body study and medicine. I think, and has done some landmark work around the relaxation response and meditation. And he won a big grant uh, from Templeton to study prayer. And he set up the, the most rigorous study on prayer that's ever been done. Multi-center, you know, randomized, uh, double blind, the gold standard in, in medicine for studying something. And consistent with what we find in prayer studies in general, the findings were complicated and uh, not what we would have wished um, in terms of prayer being a benefit. And so it was complicated because it didn't really find significant benefit with prayer. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately what that does raise is um, if you review all of the studies on prayer that have been done, um, it, it's a bigger discussion, but it's, we have to really understand the deeper qualities of prayer because there's something about prayer that's not quantitative. You can't easily capture mm -hmm. in a randomized placebo-controlled trial. There's no attention typically in prayer studies to the quality of the prayers. Just did the person say the phrase, mm -hmm. who was the prayer? Did the person who's doing the praying say the correct phase, phrase? That's a very different thing than trying to understand the quality of that. We're learning in meditation studies, for example, that the brain scans of advanced meditators are very different than new meditators. Mm. They have very different functional MRIs. The ones who have been doing it for a long time long and have time. really practiced it. And, it, yeah. and that's the thing about meditation. And I love that you write mm. about meditation and mindfulness because mm. I do believe in it. But meditation is like, I always say to people, when you first start doing it, it's like saying you want a six pack, right? Mm. And you start doing sit-ups. <laughs> You've got to do them for a long time. Right. And there are lots of other factors at play right. before right. you get your abs the way you want them to be. <laughs> it's the same thing with meditation, right? Yep. Like, the first time you do it, like we can be distracted. But, yeah. it, but you had a group of people who practice TM, transcendental meditation, right. Right? right? Who came to you and said, study us, look at our brains. Came to Benson happening. and said, study yes. us, that's mm -hmm. correct. And he initially resisted as well. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, they were persistent. And so he let them in the back door of his lab late at night after everybody had gone home. Mm -hmm. And he started studying them and I think was blown away by what he found and began to publish and write about this and has contributed to the field in a massive way because of that work. So you found then through your studies and the cases that you talked to incorporating mindfulness 
mm. and the practice of meditation and quieting the brain, Yes. but then also kind of the power of the brain, right? We say we only use a small percentage of it, but that, that it has a healing power. Yes. Yeah, I, th I think we do have to heal our stress response. Mm -hmm. That's one of the four pillars that, yes. that I try to talk about in Cured. Um, stress can be a good thing. We all need challenge stress in order to grow and learn. Running a marathon can be challenge stress because it helps you reach your higher self and expand your understanding of what you're capable of. But I think any of us, if we're in a toxic relationship or a work environment that leaves us depleted at the end of every day, questioning our value and worth, then that's toxic stress. Mm -hmm. And you then will be in chronic fight, flight, or freeze, and you won't be able to heal properly. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of healings are prevented or delayed because of that. Well, especially your field of psychiatry. I mean, that right. the, the, the stress aspect of it has to be of great interest to you. Yeah. And it does things to our insides that maybe we can't always see, like we feel them in the moment. Right. Can you talk a little bit more about what stress is really physically doing to our bodies to harm us? Yes. If we don't properly take care of it because I do yeah. love that you talk about the fact that stress mm. is going to happen right? right like I think no matter how much yoga or how much meditation or how many times you go to church right, right. or like how great your environment is that how healthy your relationships are stress is just going to happen at some point absolutely so but it's about how to deal with it the right way that's right mm -hmm. I think learning I mean I have seen so many stories Jan Shaw who I tell her story in the book she goes to Brazil, has end-stage lupus within, her doctors believe she's within a couple weeks of death. She has lupus in her brain, in her heart, in her kidneys. Um, barely can function at that point and had been declining for years. She goes to Brazil. It's a long story, but she gets better. Mm -hmm. She goes back to Idaho to a toxic environment, uh, a marriage and a work situation, becomes ill again. Mm -hmm. goes back to Brazil, gets better, begins to realize, oh, maybe I need to change some things in my life. So she had to leave a toxic environment mm -hmm. to stay better. I think all of us have different kinds of toxic situations, mm -hmm. and we have to know ourselves well enough to recognize what's going on and then leave the toxic environment or change our relationship with a toxic environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some things stressful. If you have a child that's getting up all night or an older elderly parent who's failing. Um, those are stresses that we don't want to take away. So we need to either turn those situations into challenge stress mm -hmm. and we need to leave the toxic elements of those stresses behind, whether it's changing the environment or changing our relationship with the environment. Your question is also very good about what does the toxic stress do to our bodies? Mm -hmm. If we are in chronic fight, flight, or freeze much of the time, mm -hmm. then that means cortisol and the stress hormones, norepinephrine and adrenaline, mm -hmm. are flooding our bodies and our brilliant immune cells and cell subtypes that want to do their job crisply and efficiently, but they can't if they're constantly being flooded with these stress hormones. They, these brilliant cells become numb after a while and they don't do their job crisply and efficiently. They become sluggish. Mm -hmm. Stress does that, or toxic stress does. And so if those cells become sluggish, yeah. they, in essence, turn on us? Yeah, so then that means that your body, your those brilliant cells cannot mm -hmm. defend your body from infections, from cancer, from all of the different invaders that uh, can come in. I mean, we're surrounded by billions of bacteria every day, inside and outside of our bodies. Those only become invaders when something in our system breaks down. And so I talk in Cured about how we have been taught that um, antibiotics are the silver bullet, for example, mm -hmm. and that what we need to do is to nuke the germ. Yeah. And that's a partial understanding, but we now know from research around the microbiome that's rapidly taking off that knowing how to heal your immune system is a much bigger deal. People don't, you know, see as doctors, we're trained in body parts. Mm -hmm. I was trained in to study the brain. A cardiologist is trained to study the heart. Mm -hmm. A 
a rheumatologist is trained to study the joints. A gastroenterologist studies the abdominal area. But it turns out that you don't have a heart problem, a blood pressure problem, a diabetes problem, a cancer problem, or an autoimmune problem. You have, more fundamentally, an inflammation problem. Mm -hmm. And that means, to see that, you have to stand back and look at the big picture. And if inflammation is building up in your mind and your body for years, and then some major stress comes along, you will then have a life-changing event, whether it's a heart attack or the onset of diabetes or cancer. And so that's why I believe one of the pillars of healing is really about healing the immune system. And that's a big yes, topic. That is a big topic, and I do want to get into that. Mm. One other thing that I want to ask you about stress is if we have these everyday stresses yeah. and we can feel that like, it doesn't feel good inside. Right. Um, how long does it, or how quickly does the, can the stress have a major negative effect? And if we've had stress over a long period of time, can we do something to reverse the negative effects that yes. it's caused? Great question. So let me see if I'm getting your question correctly. Okay. Yeah, I really do believe that there is a lot that can be reversed, but it does mean getting out of fight, flight, or freeze, and that is a big change in our lives. Mm -hmm. If you have to leave a toxic marriage or leave a toxic work environment, that's going to uproot your life in a lot of ways, and you have to die to some really difficult ways of living, but some ways of living that are very much a big part of your life. And that's hard for any of us. That is a human challenge. Because it could cause more stress. Oh, yeah. Right? Financial right. stress or right. just emotional stress. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. And so recognizing what's going on and then making the changes in your life that need to occur, whether it's leaving that environment or changing your relationship with your environment, that will change your life. Um, and so... You know, these are real world things. Right. Well, you had, there are other pillars and I jumped ahead to stress because yeah. I'm just so interested in like the mind <laughs> right. and, and also that before I get to the other pillars, you talk about something that I have a, such a passion for because I just incorporated it into a TED talk I did and that's human connection uh -huh. and the power of human connection and how that can be very healing. Yes. Because uh, you, you also get, talk about like being um, people who are isolated yes. and alone, but there's a difference between being alone and being lonely, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. So um, talk a little bit about that, the human connection element, yeah. and how that can be very healing for people who are experiencing major illness in their life. Yeah, it's a fascinating topic. There's so many different ways to talk about it. To get out of fight, flight, or freeze and into a parasympathetic state where your body can heal and where your mind can heal is a really big deal. I talk in Cured about the vagus nerve, which is the super highway for the vagus nerve and is the parasympathetic way of being in the world. It's not fight, flight, or freeze. You can't be in a parasympathetic healing state and still be in the sympathetic fight, flight, or freeze. Those are two different states. Mm -hmm. And healing happens when you're in a parasympathetic state. That is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is what lights up your eyes when you reach out to shake somebody's hand and smile at them. Mm. It, it's what makes you smile. It's the, the vagus nerve is what lights up your nerves to help the smile, to help your uh, eyes crinkle when you make contact with somebody, eye contact. Mm. And so they, this vagus nerve is an amazing part of our bodies that we can activate. And Barbara Fredrickson at University of Carolina, Chapel Hill, has done some amazing research on the parasympathetic pathway and how that is really in some ways the highway of love, that connection that you make with somebody. And love is not just something we have, we have with our loved ones or our small family. It's someone that we pass on the street who's right. pushing a stroller, you know? And we have a, maybe just a little 10 second chat with them, but it's a genuine connection. Yeah. That, That's what it is, it can be connection, it's right? It's a genuine love connection. Can be just a connection, not right. necessarily in love and passionate. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. But that micro connection lights up our physiology. It gets us out of fight or flight. It helps us feel connected to others and ourselves in a way that's real. Mm -hmm. And it has profound physiological effects. It, shuts, it helps shut off the stress hormones, and the more we do it, the better we get at that, and the better it is for our physiology. 
I, I think a lot of often like the elderly, right, where they're isolated, they have a 94-year-old grandfather. Mm. Just the other day for Valentine's Day, my boyfriend and I were like, let's take food to him, sit down with him, have some wine, right, right? <laughs> and have conversation with him. That's all he talked about because wow. he's by himself most of the time. Yes. So it was just about having that shared connection, Yeah. right, that... Um, I right. think that that is a different, it's another kind of love, right? Yes, so then it, it can is. just like, and that lasts for a long time from somebody whose yeah. entertainment is watching, you know, probably one of the Cleveland sports teams not winning. <laughs> 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 right? That's what he does. He's well, we've had some experience TV. in Boston this year with that too. <laughs> yeah, right? Oh, wait, don't even tell me that. You guys win so much. I don't, oh, I can't even feel bad for you. <laughs> well, we felt bad this year, but. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay, so I did jump ahead with your four pillars, and the first one being um, the, nutrition. The, uh, nutrition. Right. And nutrition, I mean, oh gosh, we live in a culture, it's so food obsessed and diet obsessed. It's right. like, eat this, don't eat this. Eggs are good for you, eggs are bad for you. Right. Be on keto. No, don't do that. It's going to be bad for cholesterol. It's like, it's overwhelming, right? It is. It's almost like if you, we went back to what our grandparents were doing, except right. food has changed. Yes, it has. Right, since my grandparents were eating and you were you like making their own bread. It's just different today. Yes, it is. So um, when you studied and talked to all of the people who had defied the odds, because right. that's what you talk a lot, you talk to a lot of people in Curate about people who were given a diagnosis of, in essence, death. That's like, right. Like, you've got, we're going to give you a time. Yep. And then it, that's it. We can't do anything else for you. Yep, that's right. Um, so you, you talk to these people, you study their cases. What, were, what was the commonality when it came to nutrition? So it's a big topic. I think that doctors and nutritionists, we get a lot of misinformation in our training about nutrition. And there are, like you said, all these fad diets out there, and it's very confusing. What's really clarifying for me is studying these people who are going to die. And there's just not a lot of room for wiggle around that. Mm -hmm. And so I purposely tell the story of the range of different kinds of diets that people did adopt. People most of the time made massive changes in their nutrition. But they also taught me that you can make all these great changes in nutrition, but if you're doing it from a place of fear, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And so you're still going to be bathing your body in stress hormones, and that's going to inhibit the kinds of changes that better nutrition can bring about. So how you approach the changes is also important. Mm -hmm. It has to be an opportunity, not a restriction from something. Mm -hmm. So and I think that's a big deal. Um, so I tell people, and I, I, tell, I tell about keto diets, because some people got better with keto diets, some people got better with vegetarian or vegan diets. And some people made no changes at all, but the common factors tended to be that people eliminated processed foods, mm -hmm. they eliminated sugars, they eliminated um, the refined flours. I had no idea that sugar is so inflammatory in the body mm -hmm. that it causes these little microvascular cuts in the endothelium of our um, cardiovascular system. And the immune system has to spend all this energy trying to constantly repair those things, and it builds up. Um, you know, you start to build up um, hardened areas because of all the repair over the years that's been done, so you get up with a hardening of arteries and things. So sugar turned out to be a big problem. You know how we diagnose cancer a lot of times is? We inject radio-labeled glucose into a person's body, and then if there's a place in the body that's sucking up that sugar, then we have to be concerned that that could be cancer because cancer's favorite food is sugar. Mm -hmm. And so as I began to realize that sugar is a big problem in terms of causing inflammation in the body, I had to deal with my own habits because I was always picking up brownies and pizza mm -hmm. and cookies in the nurse's station. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize how addicted I was to sugar. That was it, shocking. It's so addicting. Yeah. If you go through a period of time where you cut it out and then you go back yeah. at all. Oh, yeah. Then you, you're like, why do I need a lemonade? Right? I right, like, right. <laughs> I never drink right. lemonade. Why do I need it now all the time? <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, a little over 100 years ago, the average American ate four pounds of sugar a year. Mm. No big deal. And now the average American consumes 154 pounds of sugar mm. a year. And so we're so off 
normal in terms of what our bodies are able to tolerate. Well, it sneaks in in areas yes. where you don't realize that right. sugar even exists. That's right? right, and that's a big story in terms of how we got to this point. But it's it is in in a lot of the foods that we buy. Not in, some of these foods are labeled health foods, and they're not. Right. So. Um, in these cases, they eliminated processed foods, eliminate sugar. Although, yep. you know, you did, it's worth mentioning, like if it made someone happy to yes. have their mother's chocolate chip cookie, Absolutely. it goes back to that happiness factor, right? That's right. So it was, I suppose some of the cases people were very strict, but there were some, Yes. and I think, I thought it was maybe Claire who had pancreatic cancer. It was like, well, if I really want to indulge in, I, I think it was her, but somebody was like, if I mm. really want to indulge in something, like I'll have it then in that that's moment because right. it makes me happy. Yeah, because that's that whole happiness factor is so important. Mm -hmm. And so she did, she eliminated a lot of sugar and you're right, it was Claire was mm -hmm. uh, one of those stories. But she said, you know, I really like my pizza and I like a glass of wine. Yeah. And so she kept those and she had pancreatic endocarcinoma diagnosed by biopsy. That was 2008. Mm -hmm. I got an email from her just the other day. And, yeah. you know, she's got an amazing story. She's been such an important teacher for me as have all of these people that I've studied. But the happiness factor is really important. And so it has to integrate into your own lived life. Food is about community. And so how do you make these changes in the context of the different family cultures and cultures we're in? Every person has to make those decisions themselves, but it is true. I mean, 88% of, of people with these spontaneous emissions did become vegetarian, mm -hmm. but still they're, uh, like I said, I tell the story of people who didn't make these changes and they still got better. So it's not the only factor that's important. So. You know, and a lot of the when, we, when you talk about the nutrition yeah. factor right. in so many of these cases and what people eliminated, it strengthened, strengthened their immune system. Right. Why do you feel like we have so many autoimmune diseases today? I feel like I'm hearing about it more yes. than ever. It's really true. I, I think the rates of autoimmune disease are skyrocketing and have been for the last 15 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. The research is growing on that. It's hard to pinpoint with certainty the defined causes for that because these are deeply embedded in our lifestyles. Certainly there is research that points towards the toxins in our foods, the mm -hmm. processed foods and the chemicals in them. Um, and there's good reason to believe that that is playing a factor. I think that that's, it gets into the whole big topic of what it means to actually heal our immune systems because mm -hmm. autoimmune disease is really our brilliant cells and cell subtypes attacking the body. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's like, it's attacking the body it was sworn to protect. Mm -hmm. So something has gotten out of kilter in all the messaging around these cells. And is it the toxins that we put into our bodies? There's good reason to think that. Is it the stress that we live with that we don't manage correctly? Uh, there's a good reason to think that's playing a role as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's hard to get a cause-effect thing from the research, but there's lots of correlative data that's important to look at. Yeah, I, I loved all the cases that you talked about with nutrition. I think that part's going to be really interesting to people mm. who end up reading the book, mm. just because there's, there's so much talk about food today. You, you go right. into a bookstore, right? I mean, that section is huge, not only from cookbooks, but to like... Right people telling us what we should and shouldn't eat and so many diet books, right. it just gets to be a little bit overwhelming. It and really I wonder, does. Like, does it have to be that difficult? Like, is there a way that we can sort of skinny it back and make it really simple, like eat the rainbow, basically? Right. Well, I'm so <laughs> glad you asked that question because what I learned from these incredible survival stories and recovery mm -hmm. stories is that it's not about counting calories. Mm -hmm. It's not about the food groups. It's not about all of these different complicated things, and it's not about fad diets. It's about just simply making sure that most of the food you eat mm -hmm. is very nutritionally dense, that it has a lot of nutrition packed in it. That takes care of most of it. If you just make sure you're getting those foods, yeah. it just becomes so simple. Now, it's still a big lifestyle change. It was hard for me to realize how addicted I was to sugar, but once you kind of get past that, you realize, oh, this is really simple. Yeah. And, it's, and then you never want to go back to that old way, which you just don't feel as good. 
you know, your right. taste buds come alive. You start to feel healthy and you have energy and so. In ways that you, maybe you never thought. You probably exactly. thought, there's no way I'm gonna give up those brownies and that pizza right. that I love. Right. But then as you mostly, as you eliminated it for the most part, right. it's true, you go back to it and you go, right. I don't feel right when I eat yeah. it, right? So you right. realize that your body almost has an allergy to it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember years ago, it was so funny. I walked into a hospital and I had a green drink mm -hmm. and someone kind of wisecracked about it, gave me a hard time about it. As they're eating a brownie, I said, oh, really? So <laughs> <laughs> now which of us is doing something really unnatural here? <laughs> I know, right? Or like the people who say they're gluten-free and then they're ordering the beer right. <laughs> at the restaurants. I've had chef friends who tell me that happens. They're like, mm, okay. <laughs> um, so, okay, so you, you, we've gone through three of the four pillars that you discussed. Yes. So we've got nutrition, strengthen, like in, better your nutrition, your immunity, yes. stress level, and then you talk about identity. Yes. And this is a lot about... Um, self-healing how do you heal your identity that is a big question dr Rediger. where <laughs> oh harvard medical director <laughs> psychiatrist healing our identity let's i don't have a couch here <laughs> if i did <laughs> we, we, we we could lay it out and really get into it for I every mean, one of us i know right everyone, including psychiatrists every one of us <laughs> yeah. Where do we even, it's a little yeah. question, where do we even begin to yeah. heal our identity? So it's a big one. I think that we are all, we all grow up taking in at a deep level, both consciously and unconsciously, the beliefs of those around us and beliefs about us. Mm -hmm. Some of those beliefs are true and empowering and some of those beliefs are false. And it, they come from our parents, they come from our brothers and sisters, from kids on the playground, from employers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think like we, we become what we're told we become what we're told and mm -hmm. some of those beliefs are true if you're told that you bring something important and special into the world that's can be very empowering but if something different than that is implied or told to you directly or you begin to interpret the experiences that you have as that must be mean there's something bad or not good enough about who I am as a human being. Mm -hmm. And whether that occurs consciously or unconsciously, I think what that does is it sets up this inner conflict within you. And if you're giving your mind and your body mixed messages, then you're going to have mixed messages in your health and in your life. I think that's what it comes down to. I think that's so true. You know, on a, on a simple level, this isn't a disease oriented thing, but I was talking to a friend the other day Hmm. who was going through a breakdown of a relationship. Right. Probably reacted in a way that she didn't feel great about. Right. And then in the, my conversation with her, she kept saying, uh, I ruined this, I'm crazy. I know I'm crazy, I'm crazy, I'm crazy, crazy. I said, you uh, have to stop using that word to describe yourself. Yep. Because if you put that label on yourself, yep. others are gonna start putting that label on you and then you will become that in your own mind. That's right. Right? It's absolutely true. So then right. on a deeper level, when it comes to one's health and what you're talking about in this book, when someone says, right. you're sick, right. you're going to die, right? right. Then yep. That's right. the brain hears that as I'm sick and they accept that, we then accept that as our truth. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, Kira talks about the traumas that we often have in our lives and in our childhoods mm -hmm. and how that sets us up for a lifetime with this uh, stress reaction going on in our bodies kind of chronically. And, and that kind of lays the groundwork for the inflammation that then becomes the disease at some point. Yes. And so what it means to heal that is, is a really big deal. And it means changing our experience of ourselves in the world in a way that we really get it, that things happen for us, not against us that there's something friendly about the universe, that each one of us brings something of such deep value and worth into the world and to set up your life so that you honor that and you don't question your value. And that's such a big deal. And to do that for your conscious mind and your subconscious mind so that your subconscious mind doesn't uh, kind of undercut you or sabotage your life. Um, these are the kinds of things that these people have been teaching me. And this is such a big part of what healing is about. 
that I think these people, some of them, they could have eaten cat food and still gotten better if they dealt with that area. If they, because when you heal your identity and you heal your beliefs at a deep level, it doesn't, you then see it's really not about the food. It's not about these other things. What I love about your approach to everyone you spoke to was that they were an example of someone who defied their odds. How could we not look at the cases of right. what they've done? How can we right. not, how can we ignore their patterns? Right. If someone told you, you have pancreatic cancer, right. which you then basically, okay, that's, you don't want that one, right? right. There, that's a death sentence. You want to talk to the person who survived it. Absolutely. What did you do, right? So right. that's what you're doing. You're talking right. to people who have, who, who, where you said, what did you do? Right. Because if, you, if someone else did it, then it's right. possible. Yep, if one person could do it, mm -hmm. what you see over and over in our culture is, if they can do it, then I can figure it out. I know you've talked to so many people, so it's, um, it's like asking you to probably pick a favorite child, but is there someone's story in particular that just amazed you so much mm. in the most profound way that you'd like to share? Yeah, there's so many stories that have affected me so deeply. Uh, they're emotional stories and uh, they're real life stories. And so the emotions are very raw for me sometimes around these. One story I could tell right now is the story of Mire Bunnell. Uh, you know, she's a very successful executive at a, one of or the biggest uh, data firm in the country or the world and um, really good at what she does, but she's a hardcore data geek. And so um, it's, it's a good story for me because she's that kind of person and also she was seeing one of the world's leading melanoma experts when she was diagnosed with metastatic melanoma, mm -hmm. told that she had a matter of months to live. And so the evidence is hardcore, it's perfect, it's so clear. And her story is also uh, just a, an amazing story of uh, yeah, I mean, she made the nutritional changes, absolutely. She was one of those who helped me learn that it's not what you eat, it's also how you eat it. That you're grateful for the food you're putting in your body, that you do eliminate toxins and don't, that you honor your body by not putting toxins into your body mm -hmm. and all that. But she also had these, um, these dreams that were happening, the same dream was happening for her over and over again. And she began to pay attention to that and then she began to uh, uh, journal when she woke up from these dreams and just to kind of let the flow of consciousness go through her as she tried to think about what these dreams might mean. And she began to realize in the context of uh, these experiences that she wasn't who she thought she was, that she wasn't the bad one. She wasn't the one who always made life hard for other people, that she actually played a perfect role in her life and in her family and even though she had gotten pregnant at age 15 and she had been a single mom and all these things that that this was actually a beautiful story and she was perfectly imperfect as she is mm -hmm. um, someone emailed me the other day a dear friend said the word flossom you know that mm -hmm. that we are all flossomly mm -hmm. perfect in our own way and I think that's so true and she began to see and experience her story who she is so differently that she saw herself with compassion and with love mm -hmm. and not with this quiet, conscious or unconscious judgment or wow. condemnation. And at, around that time, you know, she has this great uh, research doctor at uh, Washington University Medical School in mm -hmm. St. Louis measuring this huge tumor on the side of her neck and it's shrinking at the rate of a half inch a week. Wow, a I half mean, inch a week? Half inch a week until finally, and this is something they couldn't do surgery on because there are so many vital structures that go through the neck. Mm -hmm. You have your esophagus, you have your windpipe, you have all the nerves and all the uh, blood supply coming f to and from your brain. Mm -hmm. And so you can't easily take a tumor out of that without disrupting all of these vital structures. So they couldn't do surgery um, for a long time and it's, it's a great story and I'm just touching on the basics of it. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think healing our identity so that we see the truth and the dignity and the value of who we are and not questioning that is such a massive deal, it's hard to put into words. It sounds like 
with everyone that you spoke to, it was all encompassing, right? right? Mind, body, spirit. Right. They touched on all of them, not just one thing. That's right. And I think that's such an important point because if you have a medical problem, we send the medical problem to the doctor, the psychological problem to the psychotherapist, and the spiritual problem to the priest, rabbi, imam, or minister. And to the degree that everyone follows their training and just looks through that window of their discipline, mm -hmm. then we're leaving out the interconnection and the reciprocity among all of these, and all of us live these lives. And so the experts need help standing back to see the whole picture, so they give advice that sees the whole picture. But all of us as human beings living our lives need to understand how to take all of these factors into our lived life and activate all of these things together because the solution comes from all of this tied up together. It's all one big wonderful ball that we need to see differently. So aside from then for you going through this, I'm sure this was a bit of a, like a spiritual experience for you. Right. And a, it's a labor of love, writing a book is a lot of work. But aside, so aside from like giving up the brownies and the cookies at the nurse's station and the pizza, after you talked to all these people, what else, what other changes did you make in your own life saying, you know what, they're onto something, I'm gonna do this too. Yeah, so I've been doing this for 17 years. So I've had a lot of uh, opportunity to face my own resistance <laughs> and to learn slowly and all that. But yeah, once I began to really change my own nutritional approach, I lost almost 40 pounds, 37 or 38 pounds, just by that simple change alone. I think getting rid of, I mean, I didn't get rid of all the sugar and the salt and that sort of thing, but I got rid of a lot. Wow. And just that alone. And honestly, I feel so different now. And now I'm a runner. Mm -hmm. Now I, I just don't, I really don't believe I'm going to have to deal with a lot of the diseases that people typically think is about aging, but it's not aging. It's inflammation catching up to you. That's what people are dying from. And I think, you know, I, I take care of people in the medical hospital every day and I, I see what happens to the mind and the body from years of not knowing how to create health and vitality. Do you think you're your healthiest now at this age and this stage of your life? Oh yeah, I'm much healthier now than I was when I was in my 20s. Mm, wow. And every indice seems to support that. Well, I love the book. I, I consumed it. I love the stories. Um, I love the, I feel like you give information that's apps, lifestyle changes that are absolutely doable and not overwhelming. Huh. And there's no like, you're not shooting anybody in this book, right? Mm. Like you should, you right. have to do this. You're just giving examples and stories of what has worked for people, yeah. but there, there's repetition in that, right? Yeah. So it's like success leaves clues. And so yes. you are giving us a roadmap to success, to live our, our right. best lives. What was your, uh, before we go, what was your why in doing this? What was your goal when you first set out and did that change over the process of writing this book? Yeah, I mean, that's probably a multi-layered sort of answer ultimately. I mean, it's a very personal and professional journey. Mm -hmm. So I think at one level, I had a lot of questions trying to understand what's true. Um, mm -hmm. If something's true enough to heal a physical body, then um, there's not a lot of wiggle room around that. And I'd, you know, I'd had a lot of schooling, you know, a Master of Divinity from Princeton Seminary, medical school, residency, and I was a reader and a studier and a question asker. And there's lots, there's thousands of theories out there. You can get lost for years in all the different theories and books and libraries of books. I needed something that was clear that was going to help illuminate and provide a pathway for answering my questions. And so, those, you know, that's, that's certainly a very personal journey. And, uh, but what's good about a personal journey is it gives you passion to get to the bottom of it. It's not just a professional thing. And so my life has changed at every level. I see patients differently. I see myself differently. I see health differently. I realize that as doctors were trained to diagnose disease and to start medications, mm -hmm. but we don't typically study how people heal. And we are in the early signs in this culture of beginning to recognize that and create a whole new era where we study how people heal. I'm just privileged to get to study the people who are really the flagships of health and healing. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. Thank you so much for 
talking to us. There's so many bounce back stories throughout right. this book. I mean, really the ultimate mm. ones. I can't think of anything better than just saying, you know what? I am not going to accept that full diagnosis. I'm going to take things into my own hand and I'm going to save my own life. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because if you let someone else be in charge of your mind and your body, you might not be happy with the results. Right. Wow. The book is called Cured. The Life-Changing Science of Spontaneous Healing. Dr. Jeffrey Rediger, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Appreciate it. Real pleasure talking to you. Hope you keep coming back to Cleveland. <laughs> I will, absolutely.